We have lift off. Uh, I'm live with Charles Davis. Uh, this is a, a background uh, conversation for an article that which will be coming out next week uh, on why Libya is is not Iraq. Uh, basically, the um, I'll be talking to a few sort of relevant experts over the next few days, and then and then writing that up. I'm starting with Charles because. Um, he's someone who I, I, I know from social media and stuff and who has, who's definitely a, a fellow lefty, has a lot of issues with uh, the left's take in general on Libya and, uh, you know, sort of surrounding conflicts. Um, uh, Charlie's with uh, Telesaur English and also a prolific blogger outside of that. You can check, his, check out um, his work all over the interwebs, follow him on Twitter. Charlie underscore Archie. Um, we'll start just broadly, uh, Charles. I mean, I'm sure you've heard lots of people sort of roll, um, it goes Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, sort of in one sentence uh, in discussion of Western intervention. Um, what do you think when you hear that? Well, I think it, it speaks to the fact that the speaker themselves feels like they don't need to know anything about any other part of the world, right? So if you have a few set talking points that we've grown comfortable with, um, you can just repeat them for every country and every conflict in the world. And during the Iraq war, there were a lot of talking points that we as leftists grew very comfortable talking about. Um, and the Iraq war was a time of, you know, very, you know, the left had moral righteousness on its side. We were clearly right, those of us who opposed the invasion and occupation of Iraq. Um, and now, I don't know, I feel like we've, these other conflicts, we don't, we, we, don't, we don't have as much confidence that we are morally right. Um, but we just we just transport our arguments from Iraq to these other conflicts because we know we were felt so comfortable back in those days when it was a nice little black and white binary, or at least we perceived it as such. Um, so I think there's that, that that issue. It's the comfort. It's uh, the the hearkening back to the days when there was the black and white divisions between good and evil. But I mean, also, like it comes down to simply not needing to know anything about the rest of the world. If you know the U.S. empire is bad, you can attribute any nefarious thing happening in the world to the U.S. It's this idea of, uh, now you can stop me at any point, but like this is Chomsky an idea that we need to focus on our own government, which I think, you know, if you th we should as leftists focus on that which we think we can affect change on. But uh, I think some have taken that to mean that we need to center our own governments in every conflict in every part of the world. So that if we talk about Syria or we talk about what's happening in Libya, we blame everything on our own government. So it's not just a, a matter of activism of focusing on our own government, but it's like, it's undermining our own analysis. So we don't even really understand what's going on. We kind of see ourselves as counter propagandists and say, well, here we know, we need to attribute everything bad that's happening there to our own government because that's our responsibility as you know, revolutionaries. Yeah, look, I, I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. And for a long time, um, uh, I was very conflicted about the position that I ended up taking on both uh, Libya and Syria because, um, you are sort of taking the focus away from the violence of your own government. You know, uh, when if it well, the violence of our of our collective governments in the sense of the West here. You know, uh, just to keep it simple mm -hmm. for now, um, the you know there was there were civilians killed by the uh, NATO airstrikes in Libya, um, and for me to say I think it's okay for my government to go kill uh, people in this foreign country because there is a greater evil is inherently. A dangerous moral, but yeah, absolutely. Um, I, but 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 I think it's 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 sort of been one of these moments of realization for me that you know you can't always be on moral safe morally safe. You have to take risks, or you end up sort of becoming this sort of cartoonish version of um, of that where you, you you are ignoring far far greater violence. Like we see it. Um, with people comparing uh, uh, Libya to uh, to Syria as if Libya is is, is far worse, right? Mm -hmm. People are saying, "Would well, you want Syria to turn into another Libya?" Um, is right. is a kind of line that you hear out there, and it's like, well, a huge step forwards um, in many ways. But just just returning to the Chomsky and you know sort of deep ideas side of it, which I, I I'm glad you sort of opened up that can of worms. That you, you talk about the need to um, for our analysis to be functional. So we can't, because of our focus of, of just you know just focusing on the crimes of our own government, which made a lot of sense in the contents of context of sort of Afghanistan and 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 Iraq, right? Uh, 
Um, and, and that that and our analysis is in the sense that we just stop learning about the rest of the world, and so we become sort of um, stupid. Uh, but the but the other side of that is the the moral argument about that is that we can't affect the actions of these governments that they don't care what we think and I think that's changed increasingly sort of in the post Cold War era um, and fact that, that that Russia today exists you know that uh, press TV exists Iran Russia uh, you know uh, Hezbollah all these people have English language. Outlets, because really actually they do care what we think. No, exactly. I mean, this idea, it's very kind of self-serving. It like allows us to rationalize our own silence by saying, well, we can't affect what those governments do. But clearly we know that like there was an international campaign against apartheid in South Africa, where granted people did focus on their own Western government's um, support for apartheid, but clearly that had an effect on what happened in South Africa. Same thing that the whole premise of BDS is not just that like people in the US who support the Israeli government ought to be involved, it's that the whole world, different European countries that are not as, as deeply uh, implicated in Israeli settler violence are supposed to take an internationalist stance against that violence, whether their governments are directly involved in it or not. So clearly we accept that, you know, um, international solidarity can affect change. And clearly look at how Israel responds to BDS. They're deeply threatened by it. So we know that different governments ha are deeply concerned with their, 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 their public image. It's why, for instance, uh, Bashar, Bashar al-Assad's um, media aid writes for counterpunch, right? Like the left isn't completely irrelevant. They're making an appeal to it. So like we know that we have power. And so like I do think different figures on the left could speak out against the crimes of these governments and they might actually have, you know, they might be uh, impacted by that. Mm -hmm. um, the, which, returning to you know the sort of opening question, um, in terms of comparing Iraq and Libya, um, what would be sort of you know like really from the ground up, like let's start from from bare bones basics here. What what are the what are the major differences that you see? Well, you know, I actually want to come back to something, and it's re tangentially related, which is the idea that the left has been so focused on regime change as the sole evil of imperialism. And so, and I think actually the left has regressed since the, the NATO intervention in Libya. Because I remember back in 2011, I wrote a column with Medea Benjamin. And it didn't even occur to me to like kind of whitewash Gaddafi and say he wasn't that bad and look at the living standards they have compared to the rest of Africa. That didn't occur to me. What occurred to us was to argue against imperialism, which at this point, in our eyes, was support for the Gaddafi regime. Because a lot of leftists want to forget that like before NATO bombs started falling on Libya, Western intervention had already begun. West had been propping up Gaddafi, kidnapping his opponents, taking them back to Libya so they could be tortured. The security forces that were opening fire on protesters in Libya were trained and armed by Western governments. McCain and Lindsey Graham and Joe Lieberman went out to a tent in the desert with Gaddafi. So like, I guess what I'm trying to say is that one can still maintain that Chomsky idea that the focus on your own government, but we've, we started to think that the only bad imperialism our government does, meaning the United States, is regime change. So we, didn't, we don't even see the evil of regime preservation and propping up Gaddafi so that he could be in a position to gun down people opposed to him. Um, so I, I, think, I think that's kind of like the that's analytical value. That's why, that's, yeah. That's very interesting to me because I always see like there's, there's a link that's sort of difficult to tease out between um, quietism over Egypt. So I always come back to, to Egypt. To me, Cairo is the center of the universe. Um, the the criticism uh, over the coup in Egypt and the resurgence of uh, the Mubarak era regime there now, and you know, under the leadership of Sisi, um, and the sort of um, and the opposition to not just the NATO intervention, but the the, the, the Libyan uprisings, so framing it as part of a regime change plot. You know, there are um, conspiracy theories out there. Um, in English as well, but especially um, propagated by sort of regime stooges in um, Egypt, that the revolution itself was a foreign plot by the West to overthrow, you know, overthrow Egypt, like, you know, and making sort of comparison to Iraq or to American coups right. um, all over the place. You know, it's, it's absolutely Orwellian stuff where they are, they are the American funded counter revolution, but they pretend. Right, no, exactly. That, like that um, and and when you talk about regime preservation like that's the number one um, sort of long-term evil that the US government uh, has has committed is 
is supporting dictatorships all around the world. Mm -hmm. Right, and people I think are mistaking George W. Bush's first term for like what U.S. foreign policy is, and that was really an exception. That's when the neocons were dominant, and the idea of knocking out Saddam and, and, and externally imposed regime change was the goal, and clearly they saw how that backfired, and that was the exception to the rule, which like, yeah, U.S. imperialism has long been characterized by propping up dictators. You can deal with them even if you don't like them. The U.S. never loved Saddam Hussein, but they saw him as a an asset they could exploit. And as soon as you know he stopped being a, a convenient asset, they turned on him. But dictators are much more likely to be a good asset to U.S. imperialism than say, I don't know, a, a democratic government in either Egypt or Syria. Like it's so dumb to me to think that the U.S. wanted the Muslim Brotherhood to run Egypt. Clearly, look how look how happy Israel was when Morsi got that got taken out. Um, so, so we can kind of see that, yes, they can work with a dictator even if they think he's a bastard. And even if he's not their bastard, they can still deal with him. Yeah. Um, and I think in, in Egypt, it's definitely their bastard. But uh, right. in, in, in Libya, it's a, it was a more ambiguous case, which threw a lot of the left off. Um, I mean, and I remember there was a, a very sort of um, uh, prestigious left-wing professor here in Australia. He, he, he'd actually um, died by the time of the Libyan intervention, but I studied under him at Macquarie University, uh, Dr. Andrew Vincent. For people in Australian Middle East circles, they'll know who he is. And, it's, um, and he would sort of have, he, even at the time, he would make sort of an apology for Gaddafi, or like, say, as far as the dictators in the Middle East go. Mm -hmm. is not nearly as, as oppressive as either the Assads or the Mubaraks or the Saddam Hussein regime. Like, it just doesn't kill and torture as many people. Um, there's, right. you know, ex there's more exile and, and sort of he had a, a softer grip. But he, at the end of the day, he could have people killed at, at whim and did um, mm -hmm. and was a, a total dictator. And there was this sort of um, ideological schools um, one of which I saw the burnt out wrecks of in, in, in Benghazi, where people would be like taught to read the green book. It was this kind of um, uh, sort of pretty weak Maoism. I mean, the book itself was absurd and right. had hilarious sections. Um, but there was this um, revolutionary flavor to uh, his uh, regime, which actually sort of relates to Nasserism, and, and there's a whole conversation there as well. But just in terms of, you know, how much is the left sort of. Uh, wanting to support anyone who will even put their hand up and claim to be revolutionary or socialist here? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know how to quite answer that question, although I, I think there's been a failure to distinguish between a completely externally imposed regime change operation, as happened in Iraq, and one in Libya where, for whether we like it or not, as Western leftists, you know, like uh, as a diehard anti-imperialist, there were people there that were pretty much happy that NATO came in and grounded Gaddafi's planes. And I want to stress, I didn't support the no-fly zone as a leftist. My, at the time, my argument was that the U.S. never should have propped up Gaddafi in the per first place. But these security forces, we armed and trained them. And that's an important uh, contextual background. But at the same time, I feel like there's an aversion to facts, whereas like, we have to acknowledge that the vast majority of Libyans supported the no-fly zone. Um, you can see this in two different polls. There was one from Gallup, and uh, I believe the other one's ORB, a British polling agency. Overwhelming, 75% plus. That's just something we have to deal with, whether you like it or not. Um, and I don't think I think a lot of leftists don't like to deal with that. It's too much, too complex, right? Um, and and it's, yeah, and that's something that really kind of affected my thinking on this. And that, like, I was diehard against intervention, but then everybody I met who was in Libya, from you. To, I had a, a dinner once with a Democracy Now! reporter that was there. They all said that overwhelming people, overwhelming majority of the people that we were around supported this. Um, and so I, I don't know. I feel like they should give the left pause when they just think of, think of this as a regime change operation. as just Hillary Clinton went in there and knocked Gaddafi out in her own, her own therefore she's responsible for all the chaos. What they don't what they want to do is deal with the holistic argument, that was that, which is that this wasn't just the U.S. and NATO and France coming in there and deciding to chop off the head of the state. There was a revolution already underway. Um, and so what ends up happening is if you argue against the whole thing and make it seem like it's just an externally imposed regime change operation, you're essentially embracing a reactionary conservative argument against revolution everywhere. Because um, I don't know, I'm not familiar with too many revolutions that have been followed by periods of stability. And exactly, exactly. The, um, the, the, the word that's used as well, chaos, right? In, in, right. in Arabic is Fauda, and everywhere in Cairo, between the 2011 revolution and the 2013 counter-revolution, 
you heard conservative sort of pro uh, regime people would say, "Falda, falda." There's there's chaos now. It's chaos. Everyone's out of control, um, right. and there was a real drop in living standards. And it's like, and there was after the end of colonialism, and there, you know the end right. of apartheid in South Africa, and like uh, the. Something I think which we should be more critical about South Africa, actually, but that's right, a whole right, right, separate right, story. Exactly. Uh, but exactly, like there were, you know, the apartheid fell and it was replaced with a, a kind of a neoliberal regime, right? Um, and you have white supremacists that write books now talking about, oh, you know, living standards have declined and they like took down the white ruling elites, who, by the way, still exist there. That's one of the critiques of the neoliberal government that came in post apartheid. But you're exactly right. Like, it's an argument against yeah. change everywhere. Yeah, and I mean the like the to transfer from a state of um, you know dictatorship to um, you know what was actually looking like it might be a bit of a, f a functional democracy in Libya for a moment it looked like it might um, and right. uh, which was basically really thrown off the rails by General Heftar, right? Who um, has ties back to Egypt and the and the and the counter revolutionary government there? You know, it's with the emergence of another dictator. Of a, of a would-be dictator that you saw uh, violence, uh, um, like really, right. uh, ISIS. There's this very intense fighting in 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 very specific areas, um, but there's this uh, you know, the, the overwhelming which happened uh, occurred in the months before Gaddafi died, and when once his uh, regime were, were sort of removed from the equation that there's been a lot less violence when you talk about this aversion to facts. That to me is an even more striking thing that's happening on the left is that they, you know, they people don't want to care, don't, don't seem to sort of um, uh, want to acknowledge the fact that in terms of a transition from dictatorship to democracy, that was actually a very low death toll. That's actually very minimal carnage. And what um, and what's been uh, what what's ramped back up is this you know uh, the the sort of reassertion of authoritarianism in Libya. That's that most of the violence has been around, has been uh, has been around that issue, and it's amazing to me that the left would sort of disown that. I mean, so then we disown you know the French Revolution and and every other um, violent turbulent pe period of change. Like, what's what's our position now? And no, I think I think what you speak to is uh, it starts out as rhetoric and then it becomes an actual principle that the left operates on. I'll give you an example. Like during the Bush years, you, you know, liberals were chomping at the bit to call somebody a traitor, right? They loved, they were waiting. You know, we're called unpatriotic traitors for so long for opposing the Iraq War that like as soon as we saw like the Bush administration dealing with some sort of you know some Bush official that dealt with Iran or something, you can call him a traitor real quick. Um, and, and and I feel like with the left and foreign policy, there's been this cynical embrace of war on terror rhetoric when it's perceived as being an argument against the United States. So for instance, neoconservatives and other right-wing right fellow travelers, when they're describing the Iraqi insurgency, oh, it was all Al-Qaeda, it was all reactionary Islamists, whether that was true or not, they wouldn't acknowledge like a nationalist basis for wanting to fight a US occupation. So they embraced all the, you know, like Islamophobic rhetoric, describing it all as Al-Qaeda. And, you know, the left does the same thing in Libya and Syria because it's perceived as an argument against the U.S. Like those people are perceived as being on the United States side. Ergo, it's OK for us to call them all head choppers. Right. Um, which is an actual word, a phrase that you see on the left now, head choppers. Um, and see, let's go back to Libya, which is, I guess, the, the basis of this conversation. The, the, the fact that there are pockets of ISIS there is supposed to, you know, along the coast is like an indictment of the whole operation. Although, you know, the whole revolution was basically Al Qaeda ISIS. And I've seen that. Like, it was the US and the West sided with jihadists against the secular dictator. And then, you know, repeat over in Syria the same arguments. Um, and it's really harmful. And I think it does start out from that cynical point of view. Like, okay, you right wingers have been talking about Al Qaeda and jihadists all along. So we're going to turn that back against you and show how you are hypocrites and you back the jihadists this time. And you can kind of see the attraction of that argument, but like it's completely dehumanizing. It's Islamophobic, and it, it just says, it disrespects the thousands of people in Libya and Syria that have died for for not you know international jihad purposes. Yeah, exactly. This is this is amazing to me that we have the you know these people who have have literally died um, uh, protesting against a dictatorship, and the left wants to sort of throw uh, ignore them. Or, or worse, sort of demonize them and paint them all as, you know, theocratic uh, 
maniacs, which is just like most of the people, um, uh, especially in Libya, who were part of the revolution, didn't have any deep political ideology. They, you know, uh, what happens when you use the revolution that doesn't allow civil society? Sorry, and they, they, they were basically, it was basically, you know, a primal urge against, you know, um, uh, fear and against being uh, intimidated all the time and dominated by this dictator that united, that, that drove uh, the Libyan revolution. It was this sort of sudden wave of hope that maybe something else was possible. And for the left to turn its back on that, I think speaks to a real sort of, a, 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 a great sort of, you know, there's, there's a gap where the left's heart should be at the moment. Um, there's a, a the, you know, the phrase that's going around all the time is the reality based here and it's like, right. whereas we're the ones who just look at the facts and just make um, uh, sort of factually informed decisions. To the extent to which we actually do that, I think is questionable, but even then it's like, weren't we the ones who were meant to, you know, be, be um, hoping for a better world rather than sort of preserving the old one, and you even see it in, um, in you know, sort of major works on the left, like say Naomi Klein's *The Shock Doctrine*, which we were talking about in South Africa before. She just brilliant empirical work, sort of documenting this stuff. Um, but she, uh, at the same time, she's always painting. Oh, it's the neoliberals. They're like the Bolsheviks. They're the ones who want to wipe the slate slate clean and sort of impose uh, their ideology. Whereas the left wants to be pragmatic and look at the specific on the ground realities of each situation and sort of work with what works and, you know, not be crazy, which sounds lovely, but it ends right. up um, in these cases with us sort of defending in, in Syria, you know, this guy who inherited the country from his dad and in Libya, someone else who was basically a king, you know, um, and quite possibly would have handed on the succession to his son. And, and I can speak to this personally, like, you know, let me let me be honest. I haven't always been the, the best leftist I could possibly be, right? And Syria is a great example because I spent several years after the uprising just kind of ignoring it, right? Granted, the world's busy, a lot of shit going on in my life. Syria is way over there. It's easy to ignore. Um, and then I guess the moment it really hit me uh, was after Obama's you know fake red line was crossed, and I started seeing leftists arguing against intervention not on any sort of internationalist progressive grounds. I saw like Alan Grayson. Uh, or, a Democratic congressman from Florida and during the Bush years, a real viral sensation with his really strong speeches against the Bush administration, telling Chris Hayes on the MSNBC that, you know, from the U.S. perspective, it's better if they just kill each other over there, you know? And also, we don't know, the people fighting the dictator, aren't they all basically Al-Qaeda? And, you know, I was against intervention too because I thought a few uh, cosmetic strikes against the regime didn't make any sense. Um, but I did not, I was kind of troubled by the kind of re regressive arguments against it, right? The, the fuck those people kind of argument. Um, and then a year later, I wrote about the rise of ISIS because the U.S. intervention in Iraq had begun. And I wrote about the rise of ISIS and, you know, kind of by the numbers lefty analysis. You know, the U.S. invaded Iraq, it made Iraq a training ground for jihadists from around the world, blah, blah, blah. But when I got to Syria, and actually, let me go back to Iraq. I explained how, like, you know, the sectarian government of, of Maliki, like, disenfranchised lots of Sunnis. There, were, there was a protest movement that had risen up, and, you know, Maliki, backed by the U.S., wiped it out. He stole an election with the backing of the U.S. And so I gave all these, like, domestic reasons, too, about why ISIS had come back to power, um, you know, after being al-Qaeda in Iraq and disappearing. And then when I got to Syria... I just didn't do any sort of domestic analysis. I didn't get into the history of Syria. It was all, well, you know, um, the U.S. gave some weapons to some moderate rebels and they gave them to ISIS and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, that doesn't make any sense, actually. And I, I kind of had to realize that when I got challenged on it, which is that, no, there was the same factors going on in Iraq in Syria, which is like a highly sectarian government engaging in mass extreme ultra violence, which gives fertile ground for jihadists. And in fact, most of the ISIS weapons did not come from, you know, them stealing them from moderate rebels or moderate rebels joining them, but from Syrian government weapons depots and Iraqi government weapons depots. And you can blame the U.S. for giving the Iraqi army a bunch of weapons that they would get, get stolen. But uh, anyways, I guess I, 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 that was kind of my epiphany. I was like, I realized afterwards that I completely ignored what was happening in Syria and didn't want to get into any of that because it was ideologically difficult for me. It wasn't just the U.S. invaded and that created this. It was more complex than that. And of course, I, mean, I, I mean, I remember having a com conversation with fellow lefties and saying, "Look, I don't, I don't want to write about it because there's no good guys. There's no one I want to right. back." And I mean, and if you're talking about the armed groups, that's that's a pretty you can make a pretty strong case that like there's no 
major military force that you, you want to sort of, you know, uh, pat on the back and say, great, great going, guys. Like, they've all done sort of questionable things. But there is this sort of, um, there is the uh, character, there, there, there is the uh, original uprising. And, I, you know, whenever you see a ceasefire, sort of echoes of that return, whenever there is a space for sort of peaceful demonstration, people do come out and march, and, you know, this sort of outpouring of, uh, political expression after you know decades and decades of uh, suppression, sure. and you have to be on the side of that, and you have to be aware of what um, what threatens to sort of extinguish that uh, most uh, most imminently, and that's clearly uh, the regime backed by Iran, Russia, and we, we we we're we're turning to Syria because it is the sort of pressing um, issue of the moment, right? That's the whole point, mm -hmm. Libya. Is, is doing much, much better than Syria. And that I, I do think that's a better comparison than with, than with Iraq, because you have mm -hmm. uprisings around the same time. You have a government uh, reaction against those uprisings, which pushes it into violent conflict. And in one case, you know, uh, an outside force, NATO, put its hands on the scale and tipped the uh, conflict towards, uh, uh, against the dictator, rather. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there's problems now, but the alternative where there's where the, where the dictator where the dictator is the one that receives the sort of balance of outside help mm -hmm. um, has proven in Syria to be even more disastrous. Um, and I, I think that, that that's a more fruitful comparison and it's one that the left avoids, except by sort of saying uh, as if they don't need to um, justify it, oh, Libya is a disaster. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll, you'll hear that, and if you argue about any of the details, you'll generally just, you know, be called, a, you know, an apologist for jihadi, if you, right. uh, jihadis, if you try and, uh, which is exact, and it's this crazy thing where we used to know that, well, the more state violence you throw at terrorism, the more terrorism you're going to breed, right? That was, that was like mm -hmm. a, a truism on, on the left, and we seem to have forgotten that when it comes to Libya, or Syria, and sort of being like, oh well, if if the West wasn't helping these these naughty rebels, right. then the government would just win and everything would be great. Well, yeah, you just hit on the exact point I wanted to make, which is the kind of forgetting that, like, try as they might, this isn't to say any of these jihadist groups are necessarily good people, but try as they might, they cannot match the killing power of a state, right? And the left used to recognize that there was something called state terrorism, and that the terrorism a state can perpetrate. A state that a state can enact on a population is much greater than jihadists that are like, you know, trying to get arms wherever they can. They cannot get the arm supplies that a modern state can. They cannot get the modern weapons a state can. And we recognize that when the U.S. was pummeling Iraq, when Israel was pummeling, pummeling Gaza, when it was pummeling Lebanon, right? Like, we didn't have to say Hezbollah is necessarily the greatest thing in the world, but we could talk about proportionality. Like, even if Hezbollah was the worst thing in the world, it doesn't have the ability to kill as many people as, as fast as Israel can. And that's where we seem to have forgot, forgotten because the U.S. and I think is wrongly perceived as being strongly against, for instance, the government of Syria. It certainly doesn't like it. I wish it would have a different figurehead at the top, just like they did in Yemen. Um, but because the U.S. is seen as opposed to them, we kind of forget the issue of proportionality. And that's why I want to get back to you because you're talking about how, like, in Syria, there might be no armed group that's really deserving of our wholehearted support. And I'm not going to necessarily argue with that because my point when I write about Syria, it's about proportionality. It's not that I'm endorsing necessarily the FSA or any or Ar Sham or any of these other groups, but it's like recognizing facts, right? Which is that they might be awful, but the state has the ability to kill a lot more people and they've demonstrated that ability over the last five years. Just like, let's go to another analogy, Israel and Gaza. I don't like Hamas. I don't wanna, if you gave me the choice as a Zionist always asked, would you rather live in Tel Aviv or Gaza City? Well, yeah, I'd rather live in Tel Aviv, but you made Gaza what it is, right? You blockade a place, you bomb it, you give it ultra violence for 5, 10, 20 years, and you're going to be surprised when the moderate liberals don't win out, when people become more religious in the face of apocalyptic violence. Like, come on, we recognize that there, and it's just like a cynical refusal to recognize it elsewhere, because, oh, no, no, that, that's arguing, that, that echoes what the State Department says. Well, let's, another analogy, and I'll let you talk. The State Department condemns Israeli settlements, too. When did we start believing the State Department reflects actual U.S. policy? So, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm out of energy. And it's this um, the thing where the left has sort of reversed its, it, its role. Um, the left was the one, the, the right were the people, the neocons were the ones arguing in the case of Iraq that anyone who sort of, uh, any resistance to us or any opposition to us is Al-Qaeda, that's it, you know, um, that 
or, and then eventually, you know, it sort of came true with Al Qaeda in Iraq becoming a major force and, and blah, blah, blah. But the, the idea that um, threat was these terrifying men with beards and pickup trucks, that was the neocon line. And the left's come mm -hmm. around to it um, in the cases of Syria and uh, Lebanon and, and, and other places, even, even to some extent. Oh, even Iraq. Where's the U.S. Where's, where's the U.S. Yeah. left condemning what the U.S. is doing in Iraq? It doesn't exist because they've bought that argument elsewhere, and it's almost like, oh, they can't switch out of that gear. Okay, they are fighting ISIS there, but then Iranian-backed militias are too. So does that make it good? Oh, my head's about to explode. And you know, so you're seeing a silence on 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 some a lot of the stuff happening in Iraq. Yeah, and and when the and when the when the when the U.S. is fighting alongside Peshmerga, uh, you know, anarchist socialist. Uh, Kurdish forces, there's this also this silence because we just there's no way to process it, right? Because I, I remember you, right. there was a tweet of yours that was um about how the uh, we like we that you know we recognize the struggle of people who look like me and sound like my book club or sound like look and right. sound like people in my book club, right? That's the struggle we recognize. Um, and in the case of uh, the Peshmerga, there's there's something there, you know, they, there is this this same rhetoric, right? Mm -hmm. So we. We, we recognize and sort of validate their um, uh, their right to use arms, et cetera, et cetera. And even when they're, you know, coordinating with U.S. airstrikes. Right. That, that's kind of okay, right? But, so it, it, and it's like, so are we really anti-imperialists or have we just fallen into this Islamophobic um, narrative where Islam and, and, and the threat of Islamic terrorism is this apocalyptic, you know, only, only you know, eclipsing all other threats when it, mathematically it doesn't do that but the point i wanted to make as well is that now that the the left has switched positions on syria and on on libya in, in terms of like uh, anyone who opposes state terror is themselves a terrorist and the real problem the right hasn't the right agrees with us it agrees mm -hmm. with the majority left-wing position now that um you know they prefer uh these sort of unfriendly resistance dictators in the um in a lot of cases to the chaos of Arabs and Muslims actually for themselves or shaping their own fate. So you've got this huge mm -hmm. consensus, uh, which makes you just sound like a loony when you say to people Libya wasn't a disaster. You just sound like a total loon um, because mm -hmm. there's no, the fact no one is arguing the case in US discourse. It's not an MSNBC talking point or a Fox talking point. So no one's hearing it. And when you try and make the case, which is what a lot of the most informed people in my experience believe, that it's actually a very weak comparison, Iraq uh, and Libya, you, you, you have no sort of, um, no harbor. There's, there's, there's no real team that wants to take up that argument and run with it. And that, that's one of the interesting things, though, is that the left uh, doesn't want to recognize that it won. Like, we're, we're talking about the left consensus, that the kind of lefties we don't like that we're talking about, which is that, like, let me go back to Syria, which I know a little bit more about than Libya, which is, you know, two, two years ago, I believe actually it might have been right after the red line was crossed, the Rand Institute brought together every DC elite, every foreign policy maker, right? Um, every kind of person that opines on the op-ed pages of the Washington Post. And they, you know, these people often have different views, but they all agreed on one thing. And there's a little executive summary that came out that said the consensus reached was that the absolute worst thing for U.S. strategic interests in Syria would be the collapse of the regime. So the idea that like regime change is the worst possible thing the U.S. could do that's not just lefties talking about that. That's the consensus among the DC foreign policy establishment. And as we talked about earlier, that's not surprising. Outside of Bush's first term, that kind of regime preservation, the kind of backing up dictators, even if they're not our guy, but you know, we can work with them a little bit. And let's remember Bashar and Gaddafi, they weren't necessarily our BFFs, but we all sent people to get tortured there, right? Canada did, the United States did. Um, so the left is one that argument. We cooperated with them against the threat of Islamic terrorism, which is this, right. so, like, it's not a made up threat, like it's a real thing, but in terms of like causes of, of death and misery in the world, it's, it's actually pretty small compared to a lot of things, including the state terror of these regimes, which we supported and, and yeah. had intelligence cooperation with it, a minimum. You know, robbery is a real threat too, but it's a little bit rich hearing condemnations of robbers from mass murderers, right? We can distinguish between different criminals. So Bashar al-Assad might have been right that there are Islamist terrorists here. You know, by the way, Syria facilitated their movement into Iraq for cynical purposes, because the United States isn't the only one that can cynically use proxies. But uh, 
Yeah, I mean, we, we just failed to recognize that the, the left has won the debate and that the war on terror, everybody's agreed, the war on terror is right and just. And you can't, you can't really, you know, and again, Syria is a great example that you can't really condemn the U.S. war on terror while buying and perpetuating all the argue, war on terror arguments sold by Iran and Russia and the Syrian government. If they're bombing the hell out of densely populated neighborhoods to kill jihadists, why is it wrong then if the United States then comes in there too? Which is why I think we saw so much muted criticism or no criticism whatsoever of the U.S. talks to jointly bomb Syria with Russia, right? Because like that was, oh my God, we almost wish this doesn't happen because it kind of brings all the contradictions out front because we've defended Russia. Like, well, aren't they bombing Al-Qaeda and ISIS? And look, the U.S. backed all these jihadists. So if the U.S. does it too, oh, we don't really have any consistency left. We kind of have to kind of forget what our previous arguments were and hope everyone else does too. Yeah, and it, 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 it's this thing you say, well, we haven't paid attention to the details. We, we don't want to know about what's going on, including we don't want to know if there's a genuine uprising, a mass popular movement against dictatorship, because that would upset our worldview and uh, where all of a sudden we're the ones defending the status quo, we're the ones defending dictatorships all over the world, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to, uh, you know, being uh, uh, abhorrent of our government's involvement in and support of them, you know. Um, and as you say, Bush was kind of the exception. Bush kind of made it awkward uh, by taking the ideas too far, like he really believed in them or something, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And the his father, you know, Bush Sr., during the first, uh, the, the, the Gulf War, the, the, the war in Kuwait, um, he was criticized by many people on the left because he encouraged an uprising of the Shia uh, population right. in the South, Hussein, and then, you know, left them hanging to get uh, put down by the regime. And that was something that, that we, we found upsetting at the time, that, that, the, the, that the U.S. would encourage and then abandon this... Um, this um, revolutionary uprising of sorts. I mean, uh, not that the left was all in favor was in favor of regime change then, but we were at least um, uh, knew enough about the details and were prepared to um, engage with that complexity and and show some respect mm -hmm. that that it's a, and, and and acknowledge that it's a tragedy if a popular uprising against the dictatorship is crushed. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, Shadi Hamid, um, not long ago, you know, Libya was not a disaster. And there was a response to it. Yes, of course, Libya was a disaster, and it was right. a. Um, and the argument was if that Gaddafi would have taken control of the country again very quickly, and that would have been um, because the revolution just would have been snuffed out. Now, ignoring what we know about how more repression breeds more terrorism and more resistance and violence, you know, doesn't necessarily doesn't always work to to snuff out insurgent movements. Hasn't worked in in Egypt where you've got. Uh, people in Sinai hasn't worked in Syria where you've got um, ISIS, you know, uh, with large sways of the country, right? But ignoring all of that and assuming it does work, that makes sense for the guy who's arguing it, who is an old school Republican conservative who has no problem with Arabs living under dictatorship, right? It, mm -hmm. But what's amazing is hearing, you know, sort of the, the major people on the left, the, the, the green walls and, and, and so forth, uh, basically coming to the same conclusions. Mm hmm Maybe not spelling them out so explicitly, though. Right. And again, I think it's an allergy to complexity. And, I, 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 and I'm not going to say I'm holier than thou. I mean, I, I felt it back in like 2014 when I kind of had that epiphany on Syria and that like I realized I was ignoring it and ignoring learning any complexity because that could complicate my own argument that, well, the U.S. created ISIS with invading Iraq in 2003 and that's all you need to know, really, right? Um, and, and yeah, it, it is a really, uh, it's a change from when, you know, leftists kind of talk about ourselves as the reality-based community. Because now we don't really care about any of that nuance and facts because it, 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 it reeks of apologism. Like you talk about, like I'll, I'll go back to Libya. I, I want to stress, I didn't support the no-fly zone. But like when you talk about people conflating what NATO did there with what the U.S. did with shock and awe in Iraq, which, you know, you see people talking about NATO destroyed Libya. It bombed the infrastructure. Actually, no, it didn't destroy all the infrastructure. It destroyed CERT. But it did not, in fact, the rebel critique of the NATO uh, uh, intervention was that for a couple months there, there were two too uh, unwilling to, co the, to carry out the airstrikes that the rebels wanted. They were too cautious. Um, and that's no defense of NATO. I'm going to stress, and for all the tankies that are tuning in to hate watch this, that like, I didn't support the no-fly zone, but I had to deal with the facts, which is that it wasn't shock and awe like Iraq. It was supported by large amounts of Libyans. And I don't think leftists need to come out and like go rah-rah NATO because of that. But like, it should 
when we do these, uh, it should like uh, maybe um, cancel out some of our dumber analogies. This wasn't a rock. We should just deal with it what it was. We can critique it from there. Yeah. But if we're not even going to accept that it wasn't a rock, that it wasn't shock and awe, that the U.S. didn't come in there and kill tens of thousands of people in an invasion and occupation, how can we present ourselves as the credible intellectuals which the left is supposed to be? No, we're just kind of like cheap counter-propagandists peddling our own talking points. We're not, like you can't, Absolutely. that's the kind of the depressing thing. You can't read leftists anymore to understand what's really happening. You can understand them to get like a talking point, a good polemic against something. But if I actually want analysis, I might have to like read somebody whose politics and um, recommendations I totally oppose. But at least they can at least tell me what the different groups are there. I don't, I don't think I could trust a good leftist uh, ideologue to tell me what the different groups are in Syria and how strong they are. Right? Like, yeah. Look, the, um, the, uh, one of the other people I'm interviewing for this is this guy Shadi Hamid, you know, um, and he's Brookings Institute sort of establishment quite – you know, like uh, in a lot of ways, and he, he associates with people that, you know, I don't like at all. Um, and in a lot of ways, me and him would disagree about almost everything. But mm -hmm. uh, but I, I do think that it's he's one of the few people that actually, you know, paying attention to the details because and that's across the region. He's uh, and, 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 and starting with um, the with understanding what's going on before you bring your political take to it, which I don't think the left has done. I mean, returning to what you said about comparing to shock and awe, um, I was in Libya in 2011. I didn't see much, but I, I had a sample uh, of uh, some sort of, you know, just the sort of damage in the eastern side of the country. And the, um, and what, what struck me was for, there was an example where we came, we were on the road between Benghazi and Ajdabia. And of course, there had been the tanks moving down this road to coming to Benghazi to crush the uprising at the, at the 11th hour when the NATO airstrikes began and they hit these columns of tanks moving towards Benghazi. And we got there and I was expecting to see, you know, the road uh, blown away and have to sort of weave around through some dirt track on the side. They had not destroyed the road. There were these precision strikes which hit the, um, uh, which would hit the, ta hit the tanks, burned out like the, 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 killed the, killed the tank driver destroyed the tank and incapacitated it, but didn't even sort of blow it apart. Like then they towed them off to the side and you had these sort of neatly um, destroyed tanks. And I mean, the first thing that struck me was that I got very angry at that point, thinking about the war in Lebanon, which I witnessed in 2006, and thinking that all that destruction that of, of roads and bridges and whole apartment blocks, mm. what that was on purpose. That was definitely on purpose. It, started, it finally clicked for me that the goal there had been to attack the civilian population because they are the enemy and right. uh, you know and the hezbollah hiding in, in in villages and stuff is all true too they they fire from civilian areas and stuff that's real but we don't then say oh, okay so it's okay for israel to respond and destroy this entire uh, neighborhood or whatever right? right and then i did see that side that, that kind of violence or that kind of wreckage of whole how you know whole whole areas bridges roads and stuff in libya in ajdabia especially and, they, and every time I saw it, it was attributed by the locals to Gaddafi's use of grab rockets and artillery, right? And so it was this, this bizarre situation where I was like, wow, they really can do those surgical strikes. You know, we used to say there's no such thing as a smart bomb. You know, this is like when you fight a war, it has to be like this. This was an education for me. And it's like, no, if they wanted, they can actually minimize the amount of damage that they do. Not that they didn't end up killing people, killing the wrong people. Um, and, uh, you know, in, including civilians and doing, you know, um, damage, but the, uh, the, the, they are able to be quite precise when they want to, but that, I mean, if I tried to, um, explain that I was on, um, uh, you know, one, on a lefty podcast and I, I'll never forget how quickly you get shut down if you try and talk those details with, um, uh, other lefties, right? They do not want to hear the reality of, of, of what the fighting looked like. Um, and that's, and they, it, it, and it's this, um, you know, cause it sounds like a, a I'm, I'm, a, I'm giving an advertisement for NATO, but that's the reality. The reality is that they, they did, they obviously clearly were trying to preserve the infrastructure in this case, the road was just had like scorch marks, no actual damage to the surface, you know, which was, which was amazing for me to see. Right, and I, I, again, I think that speaks to the idea of how nuance or any sort of complexity is seen as apologism. Um, another example, well, kind of a very 
a parallel would be like people not being able to see the difference. It's just left embracing demagoguery. So if you talk about barrel bombs being indiscriminate weapons, they'll be like, oh, what? Is a smart bomb that much better? And well, no, it's not that much better, but there is actually a difference. And it's not a defense of smart bombs to say barrel bombs something even worse. And I'll go to another example, US and Russian airstrikes in Syria. I just wrote a big article about uh, US airstrikes in um, Syria killing hundreds of civilians. But they're not exactly the same as Russian airstrikes. So people can try to conflate the two. Russia has killed about four times as many civilians in half the time when we do a new report from Air Wars. They have, they, have a, they have a much more indiscriminate bombing campaign practice. They're bombing more densely populated areas than the United States, which is bombing a lot of ISIS occupiers. So there is actually a difference, and it's not a defense of the U.S. to say that, right? But it's kind of read as such. Okay, and the conflating of the two, the not being able to see any details is like, I don't know, it's the, the left reduced to 140 characters, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it's probably at its worst on Twitter, where you and I unfortunately spend too much time for our own uh, mental health. Um, yeah. And so, so perhaps the conversation offline or in longer form is a little bit better. But, you know, a lot of these opinion piece hot takes uh, are not much better. And we should, we, we, can, we can probably wrap it up. I think we've, um, uh, we've sort of made the point we want to. But before you go, I'll just get you comment on this. You know, you, you write these articles about the U.S. killing people. And uh, I bet they don't get as much traffic as you might expect, you know, because it's like, when, like when Boko Haram kills people, when, when people get killed in, in, in Paris by um, uh, terrorists, that's a big deal. But when many more people are killed by, by the same Islamic extremist terrorists in Africa, uh, mm. we, we don't care, right? Um, right? So, and it's the same thing, even when, even when it's the US doing it, and it's the US killing Syrian civilians, it's still not as that big of a story for these anti-imperialist, anti-US, uh, left because it's like they're killing the wrong people and it doesn't really gel with yeah. that narrative, you know? Um, no, I mean, I do have my own narcissistic purposes for my, I wishing my article did better, for instance, but like, I really think it, it speaks to, uh, anti-imperialist and leftists preferring their narrative to reality. So like actually existing U S imperialism, which has been over two years of airstrikes in Syria, there's been almost no criticism of it. It happened. There was a few articles, you know, Glenn Greenwald did his like kind of like by the numbers, 2000 word, this is bad kind of thing. And then we kind of forgot about it because they weren't the right victims, right? The US, if you believe the more conspiratorial leftists is in league with ISIS and to kind of regime change Bashar. I mean, even Jacobin has published articles to that extent. So the fact that the US has been bombing ISIS areas, and I mean, like again, the only time that people really noticed that the U.S. was bombing was when they killed a bunch of Syrian soldiers by accident, and then became an international incident. But the over a thousand civilians that have likely been killed by the U.S., I haven't seen a single anti-war action called for in the United States about this. Two years of that airstrike. That's because I think leftists prefer their their narrative about the U.S. being dedicated to regime change rather than the reality of the fact that the U.S. has been carrying out two years of airstrikes with the coordination of the Assad government. Because say what you, they actually have air defense systems that could give the U.S. plane some problems. Now, maybe strategically, they might think maybe it's not smart to shoot down a U.S. plane, but it's a fact that they're turning off those air, air, air defense systems to allow the U.S. into their airspace. Um, and that's too complicated, right? We prefer our simpler narrative that the U.S. It's been hell bent on regime change and it backed all these jihadists and that's the root of the problem. So when the U.S. is kind of clearly bombing everybody but the regime and its allies and only apologizing when it kills the regime or its allies, doing nothing when it kills a bunch of civilians and the left is being okay with that, it's really stunning. And it kind of like shows that like our, 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 uh, our dominant brand of anti-imperialism is anything but. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a, um, a commitment to an, a, a narrative over the, actually the anti-imperialist ideology, which would be out in the streets over two years of airstrikes. But no, nothing about that. No, in fact, if I've written a hot take about the U.S. supporting Al-Qaeda, that would have gotten three million retweets. But if you're like, the U.S. has been bombing Al-Qaeda and killing a bunch of civilians alongside of them, uh, well, no, we're saying that there are proxies. That we're going to just not, re not gonna retweet that. Yeah, and, and it undermines, it undermines the, um, the, the rage people might otherwise feel about somewhere like Yemen, where, okay, the U.S. is on the side of the regime in Yemen, bombing, uh, you know, uh, using drone strikes, killing many civilians. And it's like that also too is getting sort of minimal amount. And I think a lot of this comes back to how successfully the issue of Islam and Islamophobia has wedged the left. You know, like 
the number one thing you want to do in politics is find an issue that divides your opposition and, and demobilizes them. And the, if you could not come up with a better, more tailor-made issue for the right to wedge the left with, that Islamophobia. And like, uh, just, you know, you're talk, talking about like hits and hot takes. One of the things that I've, uh, uh, sorry, back to Egypt again, I, I, I can't avoid oh, it. The, uh, around the time of the coup, I, I published like a tiny little excerpt of an interview I did with Noam Chomsky, where he mentioned, where he just said, yeah, it's a coup. Mm -hmm. right, like that was the key thing. Um, you know, it was a throwaway email exchange. I just sort of put the um, the sort of the the the, the take home. That got many, 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 many more hits than the first English translation of Mohammed Morsi's uh, uh, speech from jail. Like he'd be, he 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 recorded a message from jail. It was smuggled out just after being arrested. And this is the actual elected president of the country translated into English. No one else, like, it eventually got translated into English on, on some other websites, right? But like no one else even sort of cared to read. And this is, mm -hmm. you know, um, the, the elected president of Egypt just thrown into, uh, into jail in a, um, a US-backed coup. And the left doesn't want to hear what he's got to say because it's been so effectively, um, it's been cowed by uh, the right's Islamophobia. It's, 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 it's internalized the, the, the conservative narrative of on the Middle East and Muslims. No, absolutely. And uh, something you touched on there, which is that, you know, the people were interested in what Noam Chomsky had to say. That speaks to my own disappointment with our, our lefty thought leaders in the sense that like, you know, I'm not, not going to pickle my boy, but I am going to pickle my boy, Glenn Greenwald. Like he has a lot of power and influence, whether he likes it or not. And so I'm just kind of kind of flabbergasted by the cowardice, the kind of refusal to engage in a complex way with the, the world as it is. It seems like our, our lefty leaders have become complacent. They're, they're happy saying their talking points to their, their, their the choir, right? When they could be so much more useful yeah. if they came out and said, look, you know, it's not, it's not just a regime change operation Syria or whatever, you know what I mean? Like if they actually embrace complexity or at least challenge their readers. And that's just something I don't understand. Like I'm not mentioned, I'm not talking about trolling your readers so they get them angry and get a reaction, but like, it seems to me very, very boring to just tell your readers day in and day out what they want to hear and just kind of sidestepping any of the, the more nuanced controversies that are happening for, you know, the sake of just, I don't know, getting more hits on your part of, that, part of that is getting, we've got very comfortable on the outside um, looking in and shouting. And actually the left political cloud is growing at a rapid uh, rate. And we need to start imagining what it would be like to try and um, uh, to have to balance actual difficult decisions where there's not a clear black and white. We all we know how to do is sort of denounce the sort of most obvious and blatant corruption because for a while that's all we could, you know, um, right. our numbers were stretched thin. All we could ba basically do is highlight the most egregious outrages of the global system and try and push back. But like one of the things, I mean, I know you're based in Ecuador. Um, and you, you see a lot of sort of simplistic left-wing um, criticism of the Ecuadorian government and of, you know, uh, socialism in, in Latin America. And one of the things that struck me is that, like, left, the Anglophone left has been so far from power for so long, it's forgotten that there actually are hard choices. And so what we've got yeah. is this left-wing industry of people who sell books and give talks, right, but they're not part of any um, left-wing organization, so they've never had to engage in the sort of actual um, hard choices that come as soon as you enter politics. I was mm -hmm. in the WikiLeaks party very briefly, and you saw that there are a bunch of these people who sort of around WikiLeaks in Australia came together and tried to like, because um, we all had this, you know, we were all brought together by the critique of the of US power and the US-Australian relationship. But once that, that the rubber hit the road, it all fell apart. It all fell apart very, very quickly because no one was, we weren't ready to deal with the the actual complexity and actual difficulty of real politics. And as the potential for left-wing, you know, councillors, mayors, governors, presidents um, becomes more real, I think the left left intelligentsia really needs to be raising its game and, and, and giving intelligent answers um, and having an intelligent conversation about this stuff. And I'm... Thank you very much for your time. Um, in 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 in, um, in in view of that, you know, struggle for more more clarity and subtlety. Um, please uh, please wrap up with any any further thoughts you've got, and I'll, I'll let you get on with your evening.
Well, well, the last one, just playing off what you just said and knocking my boy Glenn again, is that the left, the left and our, our lefty thought leaders, if you will, have been kind of comfortable in their impotence, right? Um, so Glenn tweeted today that a lot of people are, are angry at lefty pundits over Syria, but you know what? It was Barack Obama making Syria policy, and you're like, okay, that's true, but that's just a canard. Like, Bernie Sanders almost got the Democratic Party nomination. The left is not as powerless as, I don't know, some of our, our pundits would like to think it is, just because that's, that's a rationalization for their own silence. No, you guys do actually have power. You can influence the discourse, at least, and not not just give in and, like, and seed the conversation to the right or the, the Islamophobic mainstream narrative, which is one out, because we don't have... Our, our strident lefties challenging that. They're just going along with the, the flow of the water, right? Um, so yes, I think the lefties to recognize that whether we really have power or not, we should act like we do and act like our words and our actions have consequences in the real world and try to deal with the real world as it actually exists instead of just our, our comfortable columns that are gonna get retweeted by our like-minded people. Like we can change the discourse, right? We can have an effect um, and we need to like tell ourselves that. I, I said I was going to let you go, but I lied because you, you said something there that triggered me. And it's this um, is this situation where look, the we do have power, and you know people talk about um, I forget it's 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 people it's an old canard that used to get thrown around by the left to show that mass movements and stuff can have an effect. Was it Reagan or Nixon who signed the Clean Water and Clean Air Act? Mm -hmm. It was um, it was uh, one of these Republican uh, presidents, you know. Nixon created. It was Nixon, and you've got. And, yeah, exactly. Um, Nixon, and because there was this, this, you know, environmentalism as a movement was a force, mm -hmm. and especially if um, Clinton's in power, but even with Trump in power, there's a possibility that the next U.S. president will be dragged to the left on key issues. You know, already mm -hmm. have, they both already have been on the TPP by right. popular activism. Right. The left um, is sort of free of responsibility. I mean, it's like we couldn't drag Obama left on anything you know like this idea that um well it was obama it wasn't us it's like obama relied on left-wing energy to get elected and we didn't get anything for it you know we didn't get anything in that trade-off because we weren't in that in the game of um actually trying to affect things we're in the game of, of sort of signaling our moral our individual moral virtue and our outrage to each right. other just sort of reminding each other that we still exist and keeping the flame alive but you know, the, we, we have more power than that, as you say, and we, and we should be doing far more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Give you I'll let you go word. on that note. <laughs> um, uh, great talking. Speak soon. Yeah, take it easy, man.